department as an assistant professor in 2008, and when I read that, I couldn't believe it's only been three years. Oh, already been three years. Yes, it's already been three years. Um, and so I should say that uh, uh, Sergey's research area is uh, generally machine learning, but I would say his interests are in um, modeling high-dimensional data, specifically atmospheric science uh, kind of data, which he's going to talk to you about today. And uh, I wanted to also take this chance to thank Sergey for his tireless efforts, along with Yushi, to organize this summer school. He's done way more work than you guys could ever realize. So let's give him a big round of hand right now. to get the poster session set up right now. So I hope to see you guys all over in Lawson at 5 o'clock. Those of you who have posters, I will expect to see you at 4. OK, here's Sergey. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? In the back? Good. So let me do a very quick poll. So we had so far four slightly different applications. One was in the general area of data mining. How many of you are working in data mining? Just a quick show of hands. 10 people, maybe. Second one was in 3D shape modeling. How many are working in that area? Well, I see one hand, two. There must be a couple of students of Kartik here as well. What about the third talk? Uh, the third talk was on information retrieval. OK, maybe another six, seven people. Yesterday we talked about robotics and uh, image recognition. How many people are working on that? OK. What about atmospheric sciences? Oh, it's pretty good. All right. At least uh, it's going to be familiar to some, but more importantly, unfamiliar to most. That's pretty good. OK, so how did I get into atmospheric sciences? And to be honest, I'm not an atmospheric scientist. Uh, it just so happened that when I was a grad student, I got interested in the project, which had to do with rainfall. And I don't know how, but it somehow followed me later on. So right now I have three projects which are somewhat related between themselves, but they also have very different aspects to them. But all of them in one way or another uh, relate to precipitation. So hopefully today I'll be able to show a little bit of what I was able to do and why I think this area is interesting. And more importantly, why I think this area is going to blossom over the next probably 10 or so years and continue blossoming after that. But first, uh, let me acknowledge my collaborators, uh, starting with my collaborator, uh, Andrew Robertson. He's at uh, International Research Institute for Climate uh, and Society in Columbia University. My advisor, Porek Smith, this work actually started when I was still a graduate student. Uh, another collaborator, Steve Charles from CSIRO in Australia. Uh, Arthur Green, who is also a researcher at IRI. Uh, Raul Gavindaraji, who is a professor in civil engineering here at Purdue, and Mike Baldwin, who is a professor in atmospheric sciences here in Purdue. Actually, if you look at it closely, there are five people who are atmospheric sciences. Right? So this is a really highly collaborative field. All of the advances are made by groups, by teams of scientists, and you need, uh, you need at least a couple of people from each side in order to make advances. Uh, one of my students worked on this. Remarkably, she's done, she's done great. She's just an undergraduate. She's going to blush if I look at her. But, uh, and uh, when I was a grad student, I was supported by the Department of Energy. Then Alberta Ingenuity Center for Machine Learning gave me generous support. And now NSF is willing to fund this work. So hopefully you'll find it as, uh, interesting as well. OK, so if you think about climate sciences in general, there are many potential applications you can think of, applications which require some kind of computation. So probably the most important one you can think of is probably weather forecasting just because we're so much dependent on the weather. Okay? But there are other applications as well. So climate modeling is another. And uh, I think what's more important is not really climate modeling, but actually climate understanding. Um, and maybe you'll see a little bit why as the talk goes on. There are also other problems which don't quite fall within these fields, uh, something along the lines of predicting hurricane tracks and intensities, something which is of interest to a lot of people living on the coast, which periodically get hit by hurricanes and suffer significant damage. Uh, modeling of severe storms, something that I will talk a little bit about today. Uh, and uh, somehow projecting or uh, somehow forecasting water supplies. This is something that I worked on a little bit. More specifically, uh, work on rainfall modeling and modeling of droughts. OK, so first of all, let's uh, look 
first at what atmospheric scientists use for this purpose. So there is one general purpose tool which has been used for a very long time. This is something called general circulation model, or GCM for short. It's a physical model of the atmosphere. Yes, it assumes certain uh, conditions that there are no external forces in the atmosphere. But so happens that we can describe how atmosphere operates using several differential equations. I'm not writing them out here, uh, but there are literally seven or eight of them. And they describe the interaction between uh, land at the atmosphere, ocean at the atmosphere, basically how the air moves, uh, how the water moves, and that's how the system would be set up. Okay. Now, in order to solve it, we cannot do it continuously. There is no closed form solution to it. So people at some point uh, resorted to numerical solution to it. And that's what GCM usually means. It means actually uh, a numerical solver for the system of differential equations. Okay. Uh, and even though the equations were described, I believe it was in 1907 or 1908, and unfortunately I can't chase down the reference where they were described, uh, they're still used today. Maybe a few minor tweaks, but this is still the set of equations that we use. So before we talk about computational challenges, let's think first uh, of what these models potentially may not be able to do. So first of all, we do not take everything into account. There are probably are external forces that we don't take into account. And there are probably some local phenomena which are not taken into account as well, because we only describe general interaction between, uh, between principal uh, objects in the atmosphere. There is also another problem. So uh, all of these models, they have certain parameters. So for example, albedo, basically reflectivity of the clouds is one of the parameters. And depending on what we set, we're going to get a very different model out of it. So this is something that uh, modelers actually play with and try to figure out what's the optimal value for it. But uh, depending on what it is, the results might vary quite a bit. There is also something called butterfly effect. How many of you have heard of it before? OK, so even though you've never really done atmospheric sciences, most of you, you at least heard of this. So this refers to what happens to uh, a chaotic system, highly nonlinear system, if you start from slightly different sets of initial conditions. It turns out that you can diverge arbitrarily if you do this. So why is it called the butterfly effect? Uh, I think actually there is, a, there is a story by Ray Bradbury where he talked about it. but. Actually, it relates to Edward Lawrence, who described the effect itself. And then, from what I read, uh, he was supposed to give a symposium. Somebody, he was supposed to give a talk. He never gave an abstract. So somebody gave an abstract for him and called it something like, uh, does a flap of the wings of a butterfly in Brazil cause a tornado in Kansas? Something like this. So the, the butterfly stuck. Nothing else did. Right? But this is a fundamental problem. Because we will have to somehow initialize the system. And even small tweaks in initialization may result in very different trajectories of the system in time. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't statistics which can be predicted in this way. And this is something that we hope to capitalize on. So perhaps statistics can be somehow modeled, but to model exact state, we need to have the precise, uh, we need to have the precise set of initial conditions. Now, this uh, physical model, doesn't put uncertainty into the model. So it's basically a, a solid trajectory through the space of possibilities. And we know very well that data is often noisy. And often what we're interested in is to get some kind of confidence, uh, perhaps some kind of confidence intervals in our forecasts. And unfortunately, this model doesn't provide this with a, with a direct way of doing this. So this is something we also need to take into account. And from our standpoint, it doesn't really use historical data. We can use historical data perhaps to validate the model, but this is not a statistical model, that's a physical model. So that's its inherent limitation. Now, this is all relates to theory. Now, what do we do in practice? Well, we crunch, right? We do numeric integration, pick the biggest supercomputer we can find, and run the simulations. So this is a Jaguar uh, cluster in Oak Ridge National Lab. I visited them a year and a half ago. This was the, the largest cluster. I think uh, there is a center in China which is now larger, so it's the second largest cluster. And people basically utilize the CPUs to run these climate models. Uh, the problem that they find is that they still can only run it in a fairly coarse resolution. So now I think the state of the art is better than two and a half degrees by two and a half degrees. Uh, 
But the problem is that in order to improve resolution by a factor of two, we need machines which are 16 times faster. Right, so it's, uh, it, it, doesn't, it, it scales linearly, but the factor is fairly bad. And uh, we really would like to resolve it to a much higher resolution than this. Unfortunately, if we're talking about two and a half degrees by two and a half degrees, or even one degree by one degree, we're probably going to smooth out some mountain ranges. And you can imagine that this mountain could be quite important to the local uh, patterns of weather. So what usually people do if they try to predict weather locally, they come up with some kind of regional model where they set boundary conditions using the general model. But it has other problems as well. But if we're talking about general circulation, I think the best we can do is slightly under one degree by one degree. And because of this, uh, and because of uh, the, the chaotic nature of some of the processes, we cannot resolve some local phenomena like rainfall, so which actually sets us up perfectly because if we have historical data, we might be able to build a statistical model for that. Okay, so as in almost any other area, we're collecting more and more data, right? So what happens in atmospheric sciences? Well, there are observation stations almost everywhere. And these observation stations collect data like uh, precipitation, temperature, wind, both uh, direction and wind speed. Uh, they, they, they collect pressure. Um, they collect stream flow if it's on the river. There are many, many different observations. We do something very similar in the ocean, but we don't necessarily have a station. We might have a bayou, for example, in the ocean, which would do this for us. And for the atmosphere, we might release weather balloons and collect information in this particular way. Um, so I think it's time to start thinking of how to fix the deficiencies of the physical models by using statistical models, but I don't think it makes sense to completely ignore either one or the other. Ideally, actually, we would like to use both. We would like to use physical mechanism, we would like to use the, the physics in this, in this model in the GCM somehow, and we would like to use historical data to help us uh, fill in the gaps when GCMs can't. So that's, I think that's the goal. I think really that's where we're trying to head to. There are alternative solutions as well. I'm not gonna talk about them. But this is one possibility. Somehow use what GCM produces for us and try to figure out how historical data can fill in the gaps and solve problems which GCMs can't. OK? All right. So uh, before I describe several specific applications, let me actually mention a couple of issues which arise with data. Something that in other areas uh, may not arise at all or may be very different in other areas. So first of all, when I talk to an atmospheric scientist, and they tell me that they have data. I have to ask them, is it measured data or is it reanalyzed data? Why do you think so? Does, does anybody have an idea why do I need to ask that? So suppose I'm collecting data from a weather balloon. Okay, I'm sending it up and it's gonna measure the, for example, the pressure and the wind speed at certain altitude. Do you think it's gonna be on a grid? No. Yet a lot of data that I would receive would be graded data, which means somehow this data was pre-processed in order to be placed on the grid. Okay? For statisticians, this is, really, this is not real data. This is something which has biases introduced by the transformation procedure, and we would like to know about it. So this is very important in this field to make sure that you understand how the data is collected. It's actually important in any field, because then you can understand what kind of surprises to expect later on. The problem is also that the stations move, so we might shift locations, sometimes by a mile, which might actually, for example, significantly change precipitation, sometimes by five miles, which can change it even more. Stations go out of order, they get demolished, new ones get built, we get gaps in the records because of this. So we have missing data because of this, and sometimes data is not missing at random, which means the fact that it's missing is somehow dependent with the value of the data that's missing. This is the worst kind, okay? This is something that you don't, some variation of this you encounter in a lot of fields, and people try to make assumption that it may be missing at random under some conditions. But in this case, we can't always make that assumption either. Measurements can be noisy. Uh, there is an anecdote that uh, one of my collaborators told me. He said, uh, there was a station in one of the farms in Australia, and uh, the farmer was collecting the data and was sending it back to the center, farmer died. 
So a collector came to get the data, the farmer's daughter met him and she said, oh, you know, here are the measurements from the last month and here are the measurements from the next month. So what can we say? How can we use this data? Right, and this happens. Uh, and one of the more interesting issues actually is that we usually don't have enough historical data. Because uh, in some heavily populated places, we might have had stations which were there maybe for 150 to 100 years. But in most locations, records might go back maybe 50 years, maybe 100 years. And we're dealing with uh, high dimensional uh, spatial temporal fields. So uh, we will run into issue of having too little data to fit really complex models. However, hopefully in the future, as we deploy more and more high resolution technology, this data will become available and we'll be able to support richer models as well. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at a few applications specifically to hydrology. So why is hydrology important? So I used to live in California and uh, every time I would drive on five going from LA to San Francisco and back, I would inevitably see a couple of the signs, right? That pretty much says it all. But we're so dependent on water, not only for drinking, but anything in agriculture requires fresh water. We use water for transportation. We do transport a lot of goods on rivers. Uh, we use water for energy. Uh, and we actually use water in mining. So if there is a significant, it's, it's to our huge advantage to be able to predict what happens with water. Okay, so first I'm going to look at daily multi-site rainfall. And you know, I, Kevin Emter. So uh, I thought that Alex would get a chance to cover a little bit of graphical models. I don't go very deep into graphical models. The ones that I use are fairly simple, but if something is not quite clear, please let me know. Okay, and I'll try to, to ask you whether I'm going too fast or not. By the way, are there any questions so far? I mean, this is not, this is not designed to be a monologue. If you have questions, please go ahead. Yes? Usually it's uniform. It, it's, still, it's still done uniformly because that's how GCM is run. If you don't have, uh, if you don't have same distance between grid points, it would, it, would, uh, it would change how updates are done. From machine learning aspect, it doesn't really matter. So the question was uh, whether the grid is uniform and whether it makes sense from a machine learning standpoint to have uniform grid. I don't know, from the standpoint of spatial statistics, you actually don't need to have uniform grid, but from the standpoint of how the simulations are done, the grid is uniform. And the predictions that you get there, are, they are on this uniform grid. Is it possible to put uniform grid to the mountain? Uh, yes, and basically what's done, people try to use some kind of regional models, which is kind of like a, a, this general circulation model. Microcosm is the same, but it's, it's, it, it, you have to somehow set boundary conditions. But then you can, have a finer, uh, you can have a finer grid because you're covering less space. But this is done as well, yes. Question? Uh, what's the typical order of the dimension of the data? It depends on what you're looking at, right? If you're talking about a spatial temporal field, field, for example, for sea surface temperature, well, every two and a half by two and a half degree point would be there. So if you look in a specific region, you can have 400 measurements and it's over time. All right, so if you're working with this data, what people usually do, they don't even try to look at this field. They try to find some kind of principal components from it, do the dimensionality reduction of the bed. It's, it's large. And the finer it gets, obviously, the larger it gets as well. Yes, Dalton, go ahead. Uh, but if, if the grid is uniform, like you say, from the stations where you collect this data, how do you then sort of like, I mean, introduce the bias into your model? Well, because so certain locations might have been visited more than once. In general. So uh, when we talk about uniform locations, these are locations where reanalyzed re data is presented or data from the general circulation models. So locations for the stations where we observe, they could be fixed, but if we were to get any kind of predictors from the general circulation model, they would be on the grid. So there is this inconsistency. You're trying to predict something at a location different from where your prediction from the model is. And this is actually quite important. That's actually a good point. Okay, so let me move on. Um, I'm already uh, half an hour into it. I don't want to run too late. So I might accelerate over some parts. There is, uh, actually, I would like to at least touch on all three applications. But do please ask questions if you have them. I, I can skip some details, uh, but I want to touch on all three. So uh, 
IRI and not only IRI but other, uh, but other agencies similar to it uh, as well, they put up this prediction map. So in this case, it's a prediction map of a three month rainfall in different parts of the world. So usually what they do, they say, you know, there are some regions where it's dry right now, so it doesn't make sense to predict what kind of rainfall we're going to see. But for other regions, perhaps we can say whether it's going to be wetter or drier. That's about as good as we can do. Right, so in some regions we can say that it's going to be 40% uh, probability below normal. Uh, in some places we can say that it will be a bit above normal. For most places we can't say anything at all. Uh, so how do I view modeling of rainfall? So there are several aspects to it. Usually we have historical rainfall data. And we assume that somebody gave us either atmospheric variables or we have GCM which gives us surrogates for these atmospheric variables. This is kind of like predictions. So you can think of it, that's the best we can do according to uh, a physical model. Also, we can have some uh, other information. So for example, recently we've been collecting satellite data as well, and that provides us another aspect uh, which might relate to rainfall. So for example, satellite might not tell us whether it rained or not, but satellite, for example, can tell us whether there was cloud cover or not. So if there is no cloud cover, you're not going to have rain. If there was cloud cover, then you don't know. We might have some Doppler radar measurements, a little bit more on that later. But there is additional data available as well. So what we would like, we would like to have a model for rainfall. And this model will actually take the atmospheric variables and perhaps satellite data somehow into account. Now, at this point, you can think of this model as a descriptive model, something that describes how rainfall must, might have been generated, what's responsible for this process. If we try to predict data, this can be viewed as something called downscaling. What's downscaling? I have these atmospheric variables. They're done, they're, they're computed on a scale different from the one where I have actually my, my observations. So I'm trying to take these observations from the grid and somehow project them or predict what's going to happen based on these measurements to locations where I don't have any observations. So this is something risk, uh, referred to as downscaling. And then I can do simulation. This is predicted data. Well, what can I do? I can use it for crop modeling. I can figure out what crop yields would be based on uh, the rainfall that I generate. Uh, I can use it for water management. Or fairly recent application is uh, reinsurance. Right, so I, I'll describe a little bit. I actually was at a workshop a couple of years ago. Um, in developing countries, a lot of farmers cannot get loans to, uh, to plant crops because the banks are afraid that the farmers will go bankrupt because of bad weather. Uh, they basically won't be able to repay back the banks. And farmers, unfortunately, don't have enough in savings to cover uh, for these losses. So I believe International Monetary Fund uh, came up with a way to insure them. The problem is that I want to insure them against bad crops because you know, you can't say whether every farmer is honest. If they know that their crop is insured, they might just say, you know what, why should I work if my insurance will cover it anyway? So what they do instead, they insure against bad weather. Because if the weather is bad, if for example, the season was either too wet or too dry, then it's predictable that the crops will fail. But if the season was good and the crops didn't take, well, perhaps farmer was somewhat at fault as well. But this is one way to use rainfall to help farmers basically start planting crops and get the economy going. Okay, so if I'm to look at the data, in a snapshot, it just looks like a multivariate time series. So I'm looking at, uh, at seasons, and I'm looking at daily rainfall in this case. And in the very simplest case, I'm looking at occurrence. Right, it either rained or not. What it usually means, it rained above a certain amount, usually one millimeter or 10 millimeters, depending on location. Okay, I would be curious whether I can model this time series, but here is the catch. It has a lot of variability. So most likely what's going to happen, I might be able to reproduce some statistics of the time series rather than reproduce time series exactly. There is just too much variability. So what I might be looking for? Well, I might be looking for some kind of spatial dependence. You can think of correlation as a surrogate for that if I have amounts. Uh, some kind of temporal structure. So what people usually look at some kind of run length distribution. How, how many days in a row did it rain or how many, rains in a row, uh, how many days in a row it was dry? I can look for some kind of interannual variability. How much do, does it vary year to year? And actually, can I somehow predict this variability if somebody gives me the outputs from this general circulation model? And I would like to be able to handle missing data. So I probably wouldn't be able to handle it missing uh, not at random. But if I make some assumptions, perhaps I would be able to do something with it. 
So I'll give you a kind of very cartoonish view of this rain generating process, and you will see where graphical models come into play. We have day one. We have some state of the atmosphere that we don't observe. And this is actually crucial because it comes up pretty much in any application. This state somehow evolves from day to day. And it keeps evolving, keeps evolving, keeps evolving. If I know what the state was, and keep in mind, this is the state of our atmosphere. This is, this is really, really high dimensional space. Basically, all of the molecules in the atmosphere at this time. Okay? Then I could tell what's going to happen with precipitation. Now, if I start imposing assumptions, and here the assumption is that the evolution of the state is Markov, I get something which looks very much like hidden Markov model. Except that I don't claim that this is really high dimensional. Instead, I say, you know what? I can't handle really high dimensional latent space, but I can handle low dimensional latent space. In fact, finite dimensional, in fact, a latent space which has only a few possible values. That's the Markov model. And this is probably the simplest and actually very effective way of modeling this type of process. So how many of you have seen hidden Markov models before? Okay, good. So this is probably a most popular graphical model, right? And Alex will talk more about it uh, uh, on, on Monday, I guess. But this is probably the most popular graphical model. Uh, it was known before graphical models were known, right? Uh, it was actually classified for a while in the 60s. So this, we know very well how this, how this type of model operates. We can describe joint probability distribution. You can think of it uh, as complete likelihood as the product of uh, all of the transitions from the previous state to the next state. It's the probability that if we note state as t minus 1, probability going to st is given to us as a transition matrix. We know the probability of starting in some initial state. And we have some probability of observing a specific observation given the state. So this is something called an emission probability. Yes? I'll try to get to it. I have a little bit on it later on. So here I'm assuming occurrence, and occurrence is fairly simple. So you can think of it this way. I have several discrete weather states or weather regimes, and I fix how many I have. Yes, the question is, would be, of course, how do I pick how many to, uh, how do I pick K? And this is something which is open to debate. I don't have time to discuss it, but I'll be willing to do it in person if you're interested. The evolution of the weather state is defined uh, using transition probability. And the rainfall generation in a particular weather state is defined using emission. There are two related uh, issues to this. So there is something called data assimilation. Data assimilation, if I have a forecast in my original space, and I want to somehow incorporate the data, how would I do it? And it turns out this is just uh, computing, performing inference by computing the posterior probability over a latent state given a sequence of observations. There is also another notion of something called forecast assimilation, which basically says, look, I don't really care about specific state space. I care about predicting the next observation. What would I do? It turns out that, again, this is something that requires us to sum out over possible value for a hidden state. And this is something we can do fairly easily with graphical models and particularly with hidden Markov model. OK. So, but what we haven't really used, we haven't really used atmospheric variables yet. And that's actually a very simple modification to uh, hidden Markov models come into place. Basically, what we do, we replace this homogeneous transition, transition matrix which never changes. We make it depend on some kind of driving variable. So it was independently discovered in many different fields. In, uh, in machine learning, uh, Yosha Benja uh, looked at it in a context, I think he was looking at neural nets, and he was able to convert, uh, I think it was, uh, a neural network into input-output uh, hidden Markov model. In statistics, uh, Peter Gurup uh, introduced it as a non-homogeneous hidden Markov model, but the idea is basically the same. We get rid of a stationary transition, a stationary fixed transition matrix, and instead introduce some kind of conditional probability distribution which uses covariates. And in our case, covariates could be this uh, atmospheric observations or predictors for this atmospheric observation. So for example, we might take a spatial temporal field, find several leading uh, principal components and use it as inputs. We might use uh, something called uh, disaggregation where we would take rainfall 
collect it on a grid and then try to figure out somehow how would we spread it around to specific locations. Okay, so, but the key is that now we have a mechanism to somehow use our atmospheric variables, somehow use our physical model. This is not the only way to do it, but it has several advantages. So hopefully I'll be able to highlight an advantage a bit later on. So a, a plug, even though I worked on this and worked on this for a while, uh, there actually were people who did this before me. Uh, this is something which was, people started looking at at night C1, but I don't think they really realized that this is a good way to uh, analyze a particular uh, precipitation patterns for regions. So remarkably, uh, after I did my PhD work, uh, this area somehow started to mushroom. So I, I've seen papers from all over the world where people try to analyze the regional precipitation patterns using HMMs. One thing which helped quite a bit is developing a toolbox that they can use. It's true in general. If you give cheap computational tools which are fast and people use them, they will, they will use your ideas. So this was an example. It took a couple of years, but uh, I don't know. They, 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 they seem to use it, and they seem to make sense about uh, the patterns that come out of it. So let me explain a little bit about the patterns. OK, so uh, here is the region of northeastern Brazil. Why Brazil? Brazil is close to the equator, and it's close to a region uh, in the ocean where we actually have fairly good predictability of sea surface temperature from one season to the next. So because of the spatial proximity, we hope that if we can predict the sea surface temperature for the next season, we'll be able to downscale the sea surface temperature to rainfall uh, in the region close to it. So we can apply this uh, non-homogeneous skid markup model. And basically what we can do, the simplest possible way is, is to state this. Look, we have actually a network of stations. So we need to figure out what to do if I'm given a latent state. How do I model this multiple stations at the same time? OK? Well, the simplest way to say, well, they're conditionally independent given the state. That's the simplest possible model. But it turns out that even if we use the simplest possible model, we actually identify plausible regimes in the data. Oh, first of all, so I'm, I'm going to skip the slide because I'm pretty sure Alex is going to cover it next time. But if we want to perform operations using hidden Markov models, they're actually quite efficient. OK, this is something that relates to inference, relates to computing most likely a sequence of states given the observations, and relates to parameter estimations. Some of you may have seen it before. If not, you will see it tomorrow. So part related to HMMs, and again, I'm kind of sweeping under the rug how do we model the emission probabilities, is fairly straightforward and computationally relatively inexpensive. So what we can recover, we can recover states we can, which, we, which we can actually explain. So I'm not showing the anomaly plots, which actually give us a bit more information than this. This is just precipitation plots. The radii of the circle correspond to probability of precipitation given a particular weather regime. So what do we see? We see a dry regime, we see a wet regime, and then there are traditional regimes. And what we can do, and actually that's something which atmospheric scientists find useful, we can actually view our data our really high dimensional data, it's a spatial temporal data, as really low dimensional time series. Okay, because we only have four possible regimes. In this case, and we see the evolution of these regimes, and it actually tells us something. And what we can do, we can actually interpret what we see. There is also another way to think about it, it's as if we try to do some kind of compression. We try to compress our high dimensional data into four possible. Uh, values for the state of the atmosphere. OK, so there are different modifications that we can do. For example, this particular model will not do very well if you try to model somehow dependence between observations at, uh, at, uh, of stations. So what we can do, we can introduce additional dependence between the variables. So one way to do it is to introduce actually something that Marina has done for her PhD thesis, is to introduce mixtures of trees, except that in our case, it's not a mixture of trees. Basically, what's a mixture of trees? It's a mixture model where each mixture component has a different conditional independence relation between the variables. So it's strictly not a graphical model, but you can think of it the latent variable corresponds to the structure, to the conditional dependence relations between the variables. So what one can do, one can, for example, put it inside the hidden Markov model. So each emission would be represented by a tree. It reduces additional dependence, and it turns out that it doesn't introduce significant computational costs. So it's actually quite beneficial to us. Uh, it's possible also to introduce out a regressive component, basically making 
the next rainfall observation dependent not only on the hidden state, but also the observation of the previous time point. And we can actually come up with uh, fairly interesting structures for this conditional uh, dependence. Uh, I'll skip this. OK, so there was a question how to model amounts. And actually, this is something that I want to mention. Because in addition to hidden Markov models, I hope that you see also uh, uh, actually a very interesting statistical model. So something which probably most of you haven't seen before. OK, so I want to model amounts. So first of all, I can again assume conditional independence between the amounts. And then things are fairly straightforward. Because basically what it, what it, uh, re uh, what it reduces to is how to model a distribution for a single random variable. And we're actually extremely good at that. We know what to do with a single random variable. We, we fit as many mixture components as we can, or we come up with all kinds of distributions to fit to that variable. So for example, if I want to model a single rainfall of, uh, random variable, as, assuming that I actually have positive precipitation, for some stations, I can just use a single exponential random variable, maybe a mixture of exponentials, maybe a Gaussian. Sometimes people use something like negative binomial. I've seen viable distribution, all kinds of things people tried. But what if you have multiple locations that you model at the same time? What do you do then? And that's where something called copula comes in. How many, how many of you have seen uh, statistical copulas before? One, two, three. OK. So what's a copula? OK, so let me kind of lead you to it. So everybody has seen this, right? It's the most popular multivariate distribution. It's, it's interpretable. It's closed if I take marginals. It generalizes to many dimensions. Uh, it models pairwise dependence, well, linear dependence. It's tractable. And if you pick up a book on multivariate distributions, I guarantee that majority of this book, or at least plurality, is going to be devoted to this particular distribution. Problem is, here is the data. And there is no way it's Gaussian. So what do I do? OK, so that's where copulas come in. And copulas use a very neat trick. Imagine that I can compute univariate marginals. And what I'll do, I'll do the following. I'll do something called a probability integral transform. How many of you have heard of probability integral transform? OK, maybe it's not known by this name. It's actually a very simple operation. I take a point. I compute the corresponding values of its uh, CDF, not PDF, but CDF, cumulative uh, density function. And then I replace that point with the values of the CDFs. Quick question, what's going to happen to marginals if I do this? If I map a variable to its CDF, what happens? Somebody who knows can tell me. It becomes uniform, OK? So I get a distribution where marginals are uniform, but dependence can be almost arbitrary. Well, this dependence is actually determined by the original distribution that I had. But if I had to construct something, I actually have a very nice way of doing this. So this distribution is called a copula. It's basically a multivariate distribution, which has all of its marginal, marginals uniform. Why is it important? Well, first of all, what do I do if I have a distribution? Turns out I can very easily go to copula by mapping the points to their, uh, to their CDFs. And turns out I can go back by using inverse CDF transformation. Okay? So why is it useful? So there is a theorem which basically tells us that if I have absolutely continuous uh, random variables, jo uh, jointly absolutely continuous random variables, then there is a unique way to represent them in terms of their marginals and their copula. So another way to think about it, I can take a copula. It's absolutely continuous. I can take the marginals that are absolutely continuous, and they give me a unique distribution. So this actually gives me a way to construct copulas. I take the marginals. I come up with some, not copulas, construct distributions. I come up with a distribution, and voila. I have something which, has, which matches the marginals but can have basically whatever dependence I put in. And by the way, this trick is used a lot in hydrology. I'll have a couple of examples. So one very simple example, how do I compute copulas? Bivariate Gaussian. I need to know the means. I need to know the covariance matrix. First thing which I need to realize is that my bivariate Gaussian is nothing more 
than a standard bivariate Gaussian with a given correlation of the transforms by actually standardized normal random variables. And then I do a back substitution trick. The marginal of a Gaussian is also a Gaussian, in this case one dimensional Gaussian, which matches the mean and the variance. So this is, this is going to be the CDF for one marginal. This is going to be the CDF for another marginal. And all I have to do is to compute this part. This is what I have in here. And that's just the inverse of the CDF. Voila. I have my, I have my Gaussian, bivariate Gaussian copula, which has a parameter rho. Keep, keep in mind that we don't really care in terms of the variance. Variance is removed when we standardize the variables. So the copula for a Gaussian distribution depends only on its correlation matrix. OK, so this is probably the most useful property. I can specify a joint distribution by specifying separately the marginals and the copula. And this is really nice because some families don't have a canonical form to generalize from univariate distribution. So say gamma, for example. There is no canonical form for multivariate gamma or multivariate exponential. But by picking specific copulas, we can come up with a more general versions of this. OK, um, I'm going to skip this. This is actually an interesting piece. If you're curious, I basically came up with a way how to model high dimensional copulas using graphical models, specifically tree structure graphical models. Something which uh, people really get struggling with. They're still struggling figuring out how to come up with families for high dimensional uh, distributions. So there is an interesting way. This is something we can discuss later. Uh, but kind of the key to copula, again, if we want to estimate it, we can estimate separately the marginals, and then we somehow estimate the copula. It turns out, under some conditions, this estimation is actually consistent. OK, so there is also a way to do it where we don't specify a specific uh, parametric form for a copula. We can do something called empirical copula. Basically, what we do, instead of computing the uh, marginal distributions, instead of estimating marginal distributions, we compute the empirical CDF instead. OK, what's empirical CDF? You can think of it as taking the data and computing normalized ranks. So you can think of copulas, actually, as a distribution over normalized ranks. OK, that's another way to think about it. OK. Uh, and kind of the, the interesting piece here is that if I apply a tree structure graphical model, actually in a copula density, it has a very nice representation. The advantage is that when we try to train a model like this, we don't need to look at more than two variables at a time. And there are various generalizations to it. Uh, for example, we can generalize it to include this Dirac delta component at zero. If we have no precipitation, we still need to do something. It turns out that we can. It's a little bit tricky. There are a few technicalities. But it turns out that even though some stations might have no precipitation, we can still incorporate them in the probability distribution. There is also another trick. It turns out that these tree structures that I mentioned, I can average them. I can either have mixtures of them, or it turns out I can sum over all possible tree structures. And this can be done tractably. And actually, parameters for this, uh, I can parameterize the probabilities for trees. And that can also be done tractably. But again, if you're interested, talk to me about it, and I'd be more than happy uh, to, to describe to you what I was able to do. OK, so skip, skip. Yeah. Um, so I'm not a part of the but uh, I'm familiar with the uh, models. Mm -hmm. Do the requirements like low tree bandwidth, et cetera? So, so unfortunately, uh, it has poor generalization beyond trees. In general, if you look at multivariate distributions, we don't have a lot of models which can deal with, uh, so if your variables are Gaussians, we have variable developed machinery. If they're not, we're still very tentative about developing models for it. So I know, for example, there is this called uh, CDNs, there's cumulative distribution networks, which give you another way to model multivariate uh, distribution functions. They have more flexibility, but they have drawbacks. With copulas, unfortunately, if you're out of tree realm, I, some things start to break down. I'd be happy to talk to you in person, uh, and maybe we can come up with a workaround. But I wasn't able to generalize it beyond some simple structures beyond trees. OK, but the key is that if we use uh, either hit the mark of models with this tree structured copulas, or we use uh, 
more richer set of uh, distributions, we can actually improve on dependence. So in this case, this is Kendall Stout. This is uh, a measure of concordance. This is something which is not, uh, this is something invariant under uh, nonlinear non monotonic transformations of the data. So correlation, for example, if you apply a nonlinear transformation, correlation can be completely destroyed. Something like this would not be. And it also fits the data better, better as well. Okay, so let me quickly mention two other projects. First of all, are there any questions about this one? I don't want to overrun by too long. I might overrun maybe by 10 minutes. Would that be okay? We we'll start at five minutes after. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be done maybe at 10 after. Okay, I just want to touch, so the previous project is something that I worked on for a long time. This one is a new project, something that I worked on for slightly less than a year. But I just want to highlight it to you that things that you've seen before, they actually come up in, in, in other hydrological projects as well. So regional drought characterization. So first of all, what is drought? That's actually a very interesting question. Uh, there is really no uh, functional de definition or mathematical definition of drought. It's a deficit of water, okay? It's not very mathematical. So uh, there are actually different types of droughts. So there is something called meteorological drought where we don't have enough rainfall. There is something called agricultural drought where we don't have enough moisture in the soil. And by the way, two of them are related, but they're not perfectly related. And we could have a drought uh, with a water supply. So for example, our rivers are low on water. Again, rainfall is part of it, uh, but perhaps there are some kind of ground reservoirs which also play a part in this, and dynamic may be very, very nonlinear between the two. What people don't know is that drought is per perhaps the most costly agricultural uh, disaster that we have. So people usually focus on hurricanes or they focus on tornadoes because these are single events which are very damaging, but they're quite rare. Droughts happen every year and the costs are tremendous. We're talking annually six to eight billion dollars. Where does it come from? Well, primarily it affects crop yields. But uh, it also can cause low water levels and that actually affects traffic as well. It affects energy, basically everything that I listed below. Uh, how many of you have, have heard of a dust bowl? Okay. So when I think of drought, I actually think of a dust bowl. It was a prolonged drought event in a southwest portion of the United States where the soil got so dry, there were basically uh, sandstorms going through the prairies, destroying everything in its paths. Oh, human created. Hmm? Human created because of the agricultural But it's still drought. Yep, there you're right. The problem is, is that this is something that doesn't happen on a daily scale, something that I've seen, something that I've shown before. This is actually something which happens on a much longer scale, and there are consequences to this. The primary consequence actually is that we simply won't have as much data to study it as we did for daily rainfall, right? Because if I have to study something which is aggregated over 30 days, I'm going to have 30 times less data to look at. And the problem is, is that we don't really have very good uh, meteorological or physical understanding of droughts. So the goal of the project is to somehow come up with statistical tools to help us at least characterize the droughts, but characterize it not for a single location, but characterize it either for a region or for different droughts jointly, or perhaps for droughts at different temporal scales. So there are many different indices that are used to characterize drought, but one which really took off, and actually you can think of it now as more or less official index, is something called standardized precipitation index. Basically what we do, we first apply, we take our data, and we have to fix, first we have to fix a scale. So for example, we're looking at drought at a monthly scale. We, pick, we, we, we compute monthly averages, we somehow adjust them to the monthly mean, because obviously means are going to be, distributions are going to be very different for different months. And then we try to figure out where do they fit according to their CDF. So it's as if we're applying uh, probability integral transform on these values. And then for convenience, uh, hydrologists map it with the inverse CDF to map it back into real line. But now the, the values are going to be normally distributed. Actually, it's going to be a standard normal, where zero corresponds to the median. Okay. And what they do, they now take these values and they say, okay, well, let's threshold them. 
anything below minus two is gonna be considered a severe drought. And you can think about it, anything below minus two falls in a 2.5% tail. It's an extreme event, right? So maybe that's gonna be something which happens once every 40 years, okay? Then we have perhaps next category. It's something between minus, point, uh, minus two to I think minus 1.5. I don't remember the exact gradation, but actually what matters is this part. Okay, so it turns out that it actually was a law that not long ago passed where Congress mandated that we need to have a drought monitor. It happened just a couple of years ago and lo and behold, now we have US drought monitor, which basically keeps track of individual values across the country. So it's pretty well known now that uh, Texas in a, is in a state of severe drought in parts of New Mexico as well. They had very little rainfall compared to their, to their norms. Uh, it was interesting, we actually were submitting this proposal uh, a couple of years ago and one of the comments came back and said, you know, it's interesting that you want to study region of Indiana because it's currently in a state of flood. But uh, that's the problem. We, we don't have a very good way to predict. We don't have a very good way to currently model or characterize droughts. So we try to at least figure out what kind of statistical tools are at our disposal. Okay, so kind of the reason why I wanted to show you that, uh, that CDF transformation is because, again, copulas seem to be the tool that can deal very uh, naturally with these distributions over ranks. So imagine that you have multiple locations. You try to figure out, how can I describe what's going on with my region? So I can use the copula again, something that tells me the distribution over ranks. And you can think of ranks in this case as surrogate for indices. It's just a, it's just a, uh, it's just a bijection between the index value and, uh, and the value for a CDF. So, but here's an interesting problem. It also comes up in machine learning. Now, I would like somehow to rank my droughts. But how do I rank points in two dimensions or in 30 dimensions? What would I do? So Dale, uh, I believe on Thursday, he said, look, you come up with the univariate function, and then you use that function to rank the points. With copulas, it turns out that there are different functions that we can use. So one of the functions, which seems to be particularly appropriate, both for computational issues, and actually might come appropriate even for modeling issues, something called Kendall distribution function. What's a Kendall distribution function? So my copula, it's a, it's a joint CDF. It's a cumulative distribution function. And what I can do, I can take level curves of the CDF. Now, if I take a level curve at a value 0.25, I can compute the total probability mass which has the corresponding CDF value below that. So what I do, I use my CDF value as a, as a, as a cutoff. And this way, I can actually define a distribution function over all of the points. Basically, it's amount of mass which is below my CDF uh, level curve. This gives me actually an index. It's not a unique index, but this is something which actually relates to a class of copulas that uh, my student and I are studying. Okay, so. But there is one very serious computational challenge, something that we're still not quite sure what to do with. So I might have 100 years worth of data, but I have maybe 15 locations. I'm going to run into cursive dimensionality. There is no question about it. So our hope is that we can collect some statistics that we can estimate with this limited data. Or if we cannot do it in a non-parametric way, perhaps we can impose some kind of structure which would be reasonable given the geography that would allow us to do it, that would reduce the dimensionality for us. One possible structure is a tree structure, something that I briefly showed you when I discussed rainfall. The different trick here is that before I was looking at density, and now I'm looking at distribution. But it turns out that one can estimate the distribution function for a tree structured copula, I would say tree structured empirical copula, where I estimate ranks straight from the data using some product algorithm. And it actually provides us with an index. Okay, so this is still work in progress. One thing which I wanted to show, though, is that unfortunately seasonality trips us up. For different, uh, if I take different stations and start, start looking for what's the dependence between them for specific months, turns out that different months I may get very different dependence between the observations 
uh, between the, the ranks of rainfall, which means that I might need to come up with a different copula for different months or maybe for different triplets of months, which will uh, fraction my data even further. So this is unfortunately, we're running into, into problems with having fairly small uh, sample size. Okay, so kind of, kind of one thought, can we use HMMs for droughts? So, I mean, uh, droughts are somehow based on precipitation. The problem is the scale is very different now. And it's not at all clear that we, will, we can assume a mark of temporal dependence as we had before. So this is something that we're investigating. Okay, let me quickly show you another application. I'm really excited about that one. This is the project that I have a very eager hydrologist to work with. And I find this application absolutely fascinating. This is an uh, application of prediction of severe storms. So I basically grew up uh, for most of my life in California. And to be honest, I may remember three thunderstorms while I was living there. And I moved to Indiana, and things are obviously very, very different, right? So severe weather is part of life. It's not so bad here, but my guess if you live in the prairies, it's something which is even more part of life. So how many of you know what tornado is? Okay, it's a, I think definition is a violently rotating column of air. Basically, it's uh, what happens when uh, the, the rotation of the thunderstorm lowers all the way into the ground. And the problem with tornado is that this is the most vicious force on Earth. There is nothing else which compares with it. The EF5 tornado has wind speeds of over 200 miles an hour, and a wind speed of this magnitude can probably demolish the bearing walls of this building. It's that strong. So there was an AFF tornado in uh, uh, Oklahoma a couple of years ago. It went through suburbs of Oklahoma City. This is what it left on the ground. You can see the brown trace of it. It basically removed soil from the ground. If I have a Doppler radar, I'll talk very briefly about it. I can actually see the reflectivity, and there is a very definite shape to this type of pattern, something called a hook echo, hooked echo. And tornado is actually in this hook right here. This is what it looks like on the ground. You often cannot tell by what it looks like how strong it is, and it can intensify and can decrease in intensity, can pop in and out depending on the conditions. But this is what it left. So there was a building here. It demolished everything to the foundation. Uh, if you heard of what happened uh, in Joplin, Missouri very recently, they had an AFF tornado. Unfortunately, it went through a heavily populated area, and over 200 people died as a result of it. So luckily, Tornadoes themselves are very local events. They don't hit populated areas all that often just because populated areas comprise a very small portion of the total area. But when they do hit, they can cause significant casualties. So uh, US is particularly prone to it because of certain atmospheric conditions. We have warm, moist air coming from the Gulf. There is warm, dry air coming from the desert, from Mexico and from uh, Arizona. We also have the uh, cool, dry air coming from Canada, it all mixes and creates very violent storms. And depending on the time of the year, the storms migrate from, from the south up north. So I think June is actually the peak month for Indiana. I don't want to scare you, but that's, that's how it is. <laughs> okay, so what do atmospheric scientists use? So one of the tools for uh, at least uh, detection of what's going on, something called a Doppler radar. Basically, it's a reflectivity radar. A beam is sent out, it returns, and we can, we can basically measure how much of the beam returned and how far away is, how far away did the beam get to. The problem with, uh, and actually what happened, we actually have a network of these radars. If you go to National Weather Service, you can at any time look at the composite map of what's happening. So if we go back, different colors indicate different reflectivity. But anything red would indicate a thunderstorm. Even orange sometimes would, would send a, a couple of lightning strikes. Okay, so you would see lightning with almost any, well, you will see lightning with any thunderstorm, but you will not necessarily see severe event with any thunderstorm. Okay, so what do we care about? We care about severe weather. Severe weather is caused by severe thunderstorms. What's considered severe weather? Very strong winds, about 50 knots. 50 knots is about 57 miles an hour. Large hail, now it's uh, over an inch in diameter, inch or, or above in diameter, used to be three quarters of an inch or above, and tornadoes. The interesting thing about tornadoes is kind of like a uh, tree falling in the woods, right? If tree, if tree fall, falls in the, uh, in the woods and nobody sees it, 
Did it really fall? That's the same thing with tornadoes. If nobody observed the tornado, it doesn't count even if it happened. Unless we can reconstruct the damage later on and say it had to be tornado, uh, it had to be a tornado based on what happens on the ground. Of course, with severe thunderstorm, we also have other effects like uh, severe flooding and frequent lightning. But this is not something which technically considered a severe storm event. So National Weather Service actually issues watches and warnings to make sure that people take cover and are aware of what's going on. So kind of to give you an idea what it looks like, this is a, a thunderstorm. This is actually more of a squall line going through California of all places. And the reason why I want to show this is because as a result of the squall line, there was actually three quarter inch diameter hail. So what's our goal? We would like to somehow be able to look at the radar, take some other information, and actually not only predict what might happen on the ground, but perhaps figure it out how this would evolve. What do we need to do this? Well, we need to find, we need to look for features in the imagery, uh, features in the data, which will allow us first of all, to identify thunderstorms, but perhaps model how they would evolve. OK, so this is actually taken straight out of the call for proposals. The reason why, I know that most of you are graduate students. You're not writing proposals, but you fund it by money coming from, from the granting agencies. And if you look at the list of things that they want, most of it are machine learning tasks. So I, I urge you to think about areas like this. There is a lot of demand for people who know how to model this type of data. Atmospheric scientists have certain know-how. That's, that's absolutely true. They're extremely experienced people who can provide you with knowledge. But perhaps we can help them. So that's what I hope to do. And I hope that some of you will be interested in doing that as well. To be honest, I think this is enough. I thought of showing you a demo, but I think that's enough. Hopefully, you you at least had an idea of what kind of problems are out there. So kind of, I want to put the slide up. Because it also shows a very similar thing to what we saw in HMM. There is this latent representation for the state of the atmosphere. It's not completely latent, actually. In this case, a reflectivity field actually tells us something about the atmosphere. We're interested in somehow modeling what's going to happen on the ground. What kind of wind we're going to get, what kind of precipitation we're going to get, maybe lightning strikes. We have some driving forces from the atmosphere. Perhaps we have a regional climate model. Perhaps we have a general circulation model, which, which guides us. And we would like to model evolution. So what do we do? We need to come up with a good representation. And we need to come up with algorithms that will allow us to have tractable inference and actually be able to fit the model to the limited data that we have. OK, so what did I learn about all of this in a couple of years that I've been working in this area? It's a really exciting area. And I honestly think it will grow even bigger. I know that climate change is a big buzzword, but there is much more going on than just climate change. And as I mentioned, we're collecting more and more data, and we're very well equipped to at least get useful information from it. Now, I'm, I believe that we'll have to find peaceful coexistence between statistical models and physical models. I don't believe either one of them will solve the problem, but together they will provide us with a better solution that either one of them can. Uh, and this is really where we can come in. There is, I do believe that the data is limited, and we need to figure out what models would be appropriate. What can we learn from this data? If we fit a model which is too rich, we will overfit. If we fit a model which is too simple, it, it's not going to give us a lot of advantage. So we need to figure out how to represent the latent space, how to represent the interactions between the state variables, the variables that we try to model, and so on. And this is probably the most important part. We have a lot of colleagues who have a lot of knowledge. They perhaps are not familiar with statistical methods, or they're not familiar with machine learning methods, but they're willing to spend their time to work with us to educate us and to collaborate with us. And we should use, we should use this interaction. And to be honest, I don't think uh, machine learning people alone can solve this problem. This has to be a joint undertaking. So and uh, kind of interesting side, side note, uh, if you give them computational tools, and if they're cheap or they're free, and they run on low-end machines, they will use them. And what's more important, they will use them in developing countries. They don't necessarily have access to high-end machines. And they need something that they can run for free and run on very low-end computers. So when you develop algorithms, keep this in mind. Yes, of course, you, if you have access to high-end resources, you need to utilize them. But not everything has to be done this way. So there is this consideration as well. I'm done. Thank you so much. <laughs>
I don't want to hold you too much longer. I'll answer a couple of questions that you have. But if you're interested, just come down and talk to me one on one. Question. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, I have a tightly coupled model, and I'm trying to downscale from this grid to a specific location, right? And basically the question, can I parallelize this? Uh, it depends heavily on the model. So there are some, some tricks which can be used to, to, to parallelize hidden Markov models. But to be honest, it heavily depends on the, on the specific model that you use. So in my work, to be honest, I haven't used parallelization. This is, this, is kind of, this is a paradigm where you don't necessarily run into issues of having a lot of data where you have to parallelize. It's an issue of trying to find a model that you can estimate, estimate uh, reliably in the sense that you don't overfit, and also estimating it efficiently. So to be honest, parallelism is not something that I, 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 I spend a lot of thought on. But I do know that HMMs do have uh, tricks that allow them to be parallelized. About other models, I don't know. With GCMs, I think what they do, there are ways to parallelize it. But actually, kind of the cheapest way is to do parallel runs of, of, of GCMs. They basically set different uh, initial sets of conditions and run multiple seeds, so to speak. It's not really a distribution, but they tweak a little bit the initial conditions, and they kind of treat it as pseudo-samples. And they come up with uh, averages based on this. It's not true parallelization in, what, uh, in a sense that Alex was describing, but uh, it uses multiple CPUs to do the same thing. Other questions? All right, so poster session is at, is, uh, at 5. If you're presenting a poster, Please be there at 4 to have plenty of time to set up. Thank you very much. Hmm? Yeah, it's in a Lawson building. Uh, if you did the lab, it's in the same building as the lab. If not, it's Lawson building. Yeah, pull out your maps. It's the computer science building. It's actually very nice.